I like that song. Not sure I want to play it for the offertory, but thank you. Till the plate passes by. Is that what that is? No, till the storm passes by. All right. All you think about till the plate passes by. All right. First Timothy four. Okay. First Timothy chapter four. Thank you, Emily. First Timothy four. For our scripture reading tonight, we're going to read verses ten through sixteen. Verses ten through sixteen reading the verses responsibly as we normally do, begin together on verse number 10. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing please to read God's word and let's begin together on verse 10 of 1 Timothy chapter 4. Ready? For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity again we have to open up your word and to read it together. Thank you, Lord, for preserving your word for us, that we hold copies of it in our hand tonight. And Lord, thank you for the good music this evening and for the wonderful fellowship we've had together here tonight. And I pray you would use the special now to continue to prepare our hearts that we'd be ready to receive the truth from your word this evening. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I wasn't there by the shores of Galilee When Jesus touched those blinded eyes and made them see. And though I did not see the empty tomb that day, I still believe. For I know what Jesus did for me. I believe there is power in the blood of the Lamb. And I believe there is healing in the touch of His hand. But the greatest of all miracles was when my Jesus saved me. For I know what Jesus did for me. I have seen the lowest sin sick soul have life anew, be made pure, pure and whole. And I have felt him loose the chains of sin and set my spirit free. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. I believe there is power in the blood of the Lamb, and I believe there is healing in the touch of His hand. But the greatest of all miracles was when My Jesus saved me. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. Yes. 
Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. Father, we thank you now for <clears throat> all you did for us and what you are doing for us and what you yet will do for us. Lord, thank you for being our God. Lord, you promise that whenever we gather together, there you are in the midst, and we believe you're here this evening. And I want to ask you, Lord, to minister uh, to the people of God here this evening. Lord, use your word of God in each of our hearts. Spirit of God, uh, be the master teacher this evening. And I pray that you would help each of us as we open up your word and look at it, that you would open our eyes, that we could build wondrous things out of your law tonight. Lord, may you have your way in each one of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. If you <clears throat> open your Bible again to 1 Timothy chapter 4, you know, Paul is writing here to Timothy, of course, his preacher boy in the faith, as it were, teaching him about the ministry. Of course, this is under divine inspiration uh, that he's giving Timothy some instruction, but he's trying to help the young preacher. And one of the ways that Paul was able to help the preachers and really other Christians was to be able to be an example to them. Uh, he told the church in Corinth, Be ye followers of me, even as I follow Christ. Uh, he told uh, in Philippi, the Philippian believers, he said the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. He's saying, uh, the things you've heard from me, you've listened to me, you've uh, received them from me, I want you to do those things. I want to, you to follow my example. So Paul was saying, I'm an example. I'm a pattern for you to follow, Timothy. And, and I want to talk to you tonight on that subject, do as I do. Someone said, example is not the main thing in influencing others. It's the only thing. Jesus said He was our example that we should follow His steps. And so we know that many of the things that Jesus did, we talked in our 5.30 class about baptism. Jesus was baptized not because He needed to be baptized. He was baptized to be an example for us so that we could follow His steps and we would be our example in all things. So here in 1 Timothy chapter 4, I want to remind you that first of all, we are all to be examples. That's not just for the preacher. That's not just for Paul. That's not just for the missionary. That's not just for the evangelist. All of us as believers in Christ are to be examples. Now he's encouraging him here in, in 1 Timothy uh, to be an example. Notice verse number 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. Notice, he didn't say, let no man despise your age. Okay, He's talking to a young Timothy here. A young man. Sometimes we think, well, you know, you got to let those young people sow their wild oats. Where's that in the Bible? No, the, the example ought to be the young Christian. The example is you ought to, you ought to, you ought to be able to follow Christ and be an example in these areas we're going to talk about tonight. And he's urging that upon the young people. Mom and dad, don't look at young people and say, well, now, you know, one day they'll get with it. No, they ought to get with it right now. Uh, they ought to be with it right now. They ought to be following Christ right now. They ought to be loving the Lord right now. They ought to be desiring to follow His example right now. While they're young. The Bible says it's good to bear the yoke in your youth. And it's good to follow Christ as a young example. So, we're to be examples. An example is a model. It's a pattern. Someone could follow your pattern and they would be like Christ because you're following His example. Now, notice what he says in verse 12. Be example uh, of the believers in word. The very first thing he goes to is our tongue. What did James say about our tongue? said in James chapter 3 and verse 2 that the one who can bridle his tongue the same is the mature Christian. It says if I want to measure your spirituality, I'm not going to your attendance record. I'm not going to how you look. I'm listening to what you say. I'm listening to your tongue. It's a sign of spiritual maturity. How do you 
You know, I looked up at several things. Most of us have, through the years, uh, the, the press has caught on and they're good at publishing people who say things when they think the microphone isn't on. And sometimes I, I can't repeat what's said when the microphone's not on because they're, they're vulgarities. But they, they don't speak the same way as when the microphone's on. You know, God's microphone's always on. God hears everything we say. The, one of the most, I think one of the most uh, serious, sobering verses in the Bible is when Jesus said, By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. If you think about it, what would happen if we just recorded everything we said for 24 hours or maybe for a week and then listened to it back? Parents, have you ever gone through the exercise of hearing your children say something that you've said and when you hear it come out of their mouth, you think, ooh, that doesn't sound so good. But you realize that's come out of my mouth. And now you realize I better make some changes. I don't like it when I hear it coming back to me. I was reading about some of these microphone gaffes, and I recall this one. Some of you who aren't very old won't, but it was 1984, and President Reagan was about to be on the radio. And as a sound check, he didn't think the microphone was live yet, he said this statement, my fellow Americans, I'm pleased to tell you today that I've signed legislation that will outlaw Russia forever. We begin bombing in five minutes. <laughs> uh, I miss Ronald Reagan, amen? But what a, and, and while that didn't actually end up getting broadcast, boy, I tell you what, it sure made it out. And uh, Russia didn't appreciate it too much either. <laughs> But you know what? He didn't much care. But uh, it was, uh, remember that. There was a newswoman I read that was covering George W. Bush's speech. And, and she was doing the preliminary thing. And when they turned it over to her, they never turned her mic off. And she ended up in another conversation with another woman. And the good thing was she talked about her husband and how he was compassionate and thoughtful and just a great, great guy. And then she proceeded to say, but his sister is a complete control freak. <laughs> and that went out over top of President Bush's speech on the air. I imagine she had some family issues to deal with after that. Bob Jones Sr. said this, there's nothing today, and by the way, Bob Jones Sr. died in 1967 or 68. How many years ago was that? 50? 50 years ago, wow. He said this, There's nothing today that is doing more to deaden the spiritual testimony of Orthodox Christianity than the long, backbiting, mean tongues of some supposedly Orthodox Christians. They're Christians that talk about a separated life, boast about what they do and don't do, speak with great pride about their loyalty to Orthodoxy, but who spend their time dipping their tongues in the slime of slander and speaking the death warrant to the reputation of other Christians. The Bible's filled with condemnation of people that slander other people. It condemns with great severity people who even take up a reproach about other people. It's just as bad to carry a rumor around after it starts as it is to start one. Boy, that's quiet. Bob Jones Sr. Lack of control of your Christian tongue is a sign of failure in living for the Savior. James 1, verse 26, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. It's empty. Hold your finger there in 1 Timothy 4. We're going to come back to that in just a moment. Look at Ephesians chapter 4 with me, would you please? Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> you can 
you, you, you really, it's hard to just jump into this, but, but if you just, I just want to remind you, he's talking about putting off and putting on in, in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. And in the put off, in verse 22, he says, you put off the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24, you're putting on the new man, which after God is created in righteous and true holiness. And he talks about what you put away. You put away lying and you speak every man truth with his neighbor. We're members of another. You, you be angry, but sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. If you do, verse 27 happens. You give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. Rather, let him labor, work with his hands, the thing which is good. They may have to give him that needeth. Now, verse 29. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Don't let anything corrupt, and corrupt, by the way, he's contrasting that which, that, but that which is good to the use of edifying. What does edify mean? Yeah, to build up. So I, I want to make sure that no communication comes out of my mouth that's going to tear someone down, but I'm going to let the communication come out that will build them up. If I can't, hey, if I can't let it come out of my mouth to build them up, then it doesn't need to come out of my mouth. Period. Let it go. Uh, that because when it, if I do, then the next thing happens. Verse thirty: Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. When I speak corruptly and I let that come out of my mouth, which tears down other believers and tears down other people, it grieves the Holy Spirit of God in my life. Let all, verse 31, let all, uh, most, some, no, all, all bitterness, all wrath, all anger, all clamor, all evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. <clears throat> the very first place he starts when we're going to be an example believer is our tongue, our words. Sometimes you ought to just, just you know, try, t try it sometimes. Say, I want to go 24 hours and have people help you. I want to go 24 hours and not say anything negative about anything. You'll find out how negative you are. I mean, I mean all of us. Uh, we're just we're just kind of being wired that way in America, but it's not it's not something that helps us. It hurts us. Uh, it really has hurt us. So the words that we speak, and by the way, we know from the Lord Jesus that our words come from our heart. What's down in the well comes up in the bucket. Okay, so we have to. If we're going to change our words. We have to guard our heart what goes in, alright? So he says your words. Now, go back to 1 Timothy chapter 4. He said we're going to be an example in word, in conversation. That's how you know. See, our, our language has deteriorated so much that conversation means what today? Just our words. But you see, in, in Bible times, it uses word, and then it uses in conversation. So we know conversation must be more than just words. And it is. Conversation was how we lived our life. It wasn't just words, it was our walk as well. So he's saying you be an example, not just in, in how, how, what you say, but in how you, how you walk as well. We're not just to talk a good Christian life, we're supposed to walk a good Christian life. Our walk has to match our talk. In fact, turn back to 1 Peter chapter 3 with me, will you please? 1 Peter chapter 3. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3, you have an example here of a wife that has an unsaved husband. And Peter's giving some instruction here about how she can reach that unsaved husband. All right? Notice what he says in verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the, there's our word, conversation of the wives. Now, that word conversation, is that talking about this? Huh. No. Not talking about your words, it's talking about your walk. 
Okay, talking about your manner of life, how you're living. And notice what he said, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Then he talks about who's adorning. Let it not be the outward adorning of the plating of the hair, the wearing of gold, the putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, the ornament of a meek and a quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. I'm saying the way you win that unsaved husband is not by what you come, not by the words you use. Though the words, the words aren't unimportant. But what really is going to make the impact is not your words, but your walk. How you're living in that meek and quiet spirit. It's not how you look on the outside, but how your spirit is on the inside. That's what's going to be effective. And so be, be the, 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 the manner, the, the change in your life. We used to talk about that. I remember growing up, um, uh, I was singing the other day about, um, uh, no, it was this morning. I heard a guy on the radio talk about a little chorus we sang when I was a teenager. Uh, Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is to know the Savior, living a life within His favor. Having a change in my behavior, happiness is the Lord. Yeah, we say what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Yeah, things ought to be different. Things, changes take place when Jesus comes into your heart. Amen? And, and it ought to be a change in your behavior. Would you understand that somebody's looking up to you? Somebody's trying to be like you as a Christian? When I was just an a eighth grader, uh, we, there was a fellow who lived right next door to the church we were going to at the time, Milheim Baptist Church, and his name was Bob Lamb. Bob Lamb had a tremendous impact on me. But I was, I was in sports and athletic, and, and uh, Bob Lamb was athletic. And he, was, he played basketball and softball, and he was a big baseball fan. He, he named his firstborn son Hank after Hank Aaron. And, uh, man, he was right on. And, uh, and, and, so just, uh, and he was my eighth grade Sunday school teacher and, uh, in, in Sunday school. And, and he made a, a tremendous, uh, drove the bus, was bus ministry, and a, and a good soul winner, cleaned the church, and sometimes I'd go clean the church with him. Uh, just was a great impact in my life. You know what? I didn't know really, if you told me at eighth grade, be like Jesus, I wasn't quite sure what that would mean. But if you said, be like Bob Lamb, I could say I could be like Bob Lamb. I, I'd want to be like him. Now, he, didn't, he may know it, he may not have known it, but he was my example. He was the one I was trying to be like. Well, somebody's trying to be like you. You may not know who it is. You may be unaware that someone's trying to be like you, but you're the best Christian somebody knows. And so be an example. In word, in your walk, and then the next part in 1 Timothy chapter 4 is in charity. 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 Helping those that are in need. It's not only helping those that are in need, it has a, a context here of being lenient in passing judgment on others. In fact, when you go to 1 Corinthians 13, about charity, and charity suffers long and is kind. There's oftentimes, you know, we can suffer long and not be real kind about it. Okay? I, 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 won't, <clears throat> I won't go into the whole story. It would take too long. Okay? We, we had... Uh, upgraded, we were going to upgrade our phones. And I went to our carrier, we upgraded them. We had them for, I think, three days. And my son-in-law called and said, Target, if you upgrade on their Black Friday sale, they'll give you $250 gift card for each phone you upgrade. Both phones, that's $500. But you've got to be there at 6 o'clock Thanksgiving night when they open the store. <sighs> now, you're not going to talk my wife out of $500 no matter how you're going to do it. It isn't going to happen. So what did we do? We took the phones back to Verizon, turned them back in. I had to pay $70, $35 each phone restocking fee. But we told them why. I said, they're giving us 500 bucks to get them at Target. So I might as well get $500 to get them at Target. And the guy said, I don't blame you. So they took them back. And at 4 o'clock, 
Thanksgiving afternoon, ate dinner, and got in the car and drove over to Target. My wife, my daughter, Andy, my other son got in line. I stayed in the car and took a nap. <laughs> then I went and got them hot chocolate and brought it back to them. Six o'clock, I decided, okay, they opened the doors. I better go, go get in because I'm the account holder. I got to be there. They all ran in to try to get, you know, jockeying for position. Some of you have been in that stuff, man. I, I, I don't care for that all. Anyway, I can't, man, I can't go into all this. Um, the, the point being, we were, I think we were eighth on the list. They took our information, said it'll be about an hour and 20 minutes. Two hours later, while we're still sitting there, we're supposed to get a text. We wouldn't stand there. I went up and sat down in the cafe. And um, they're supposed to send you a text message, to Danny, when they're ready for you, you know. Finally, I just walked back there, and, and uh, Andy got helped, and then they're ready to do us. So we sit down, and she starts putting all the information in, and she stops and just looking at her computer. The computer froze up. It's just spinning. So she's got to call her IT support. 25 minutes sitting on hold. I'm, I'm suffering long. <laughs> it's, the, it's the being kind part I'm having trouble with, okay? And, and I, I won't tell you, I, I'll tell you this. Long story short, we, we got home about 10.45 that night, okay? We had our phones. My wife had her gift cards. And I suffered long. <laughs> I wish I could say I was kind, but I'm not sure I was. I was quiet. I didn't, get, <laughs> I didn't verbalize anything. It was funny because my, my kids know me. And they, Amy said, we all talked before you came home. They said, now when they come in, don't anybody say anything to Dad. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably pretty smart, all right? But, so, you know, charity suffers long and is kind. That's where the difficulty comes in. Every husband has probably waited some time for your wife and waited and waited and she finally comes, but are you kind when she does come? Or is it, what took you so long? What was the problem? Hmm? See, sometimes we're not very kind. That's not being a good example in charity. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity thinketh no evil. Well, yeah, I know why they asked me for that or I know why they said that. Are you thinking no evil? Are you believing all things? Are you believing the best? Are you thinking the worst? Boy, it's quiet. Am I an example of charity? Am I, am I lenient before I pass judgment on others? Am I, am I willing to help those who are in need? Be an example of believers in word, in our walk, in charity. And then he says, in spirit. In spirit. In spirit there, it's a small s, it's your attitude. Just as our, our words were linked with our walk, our charity is linked with our spirit. Not only can I do good things for others, you know I can do good things for others and not have a good attitude when I do it? I can have a bad spirit even though I'm helping, doing something good. So it's having the right attitude. Giving help to somebody who needs it and doing it with the right attitude. Charity and your spirit go together. Be charitable, be helpful, but don't grumble while you're doing it. Don't, uh, all right, come on, let's go. We, we all can fall into that. You know, I like what it says about Daniel in Daniel 6 and verse 3 about how Daniel had an excellent spirit. Daniel just had a good spirit about him. And I think that, that, that played a part in his rise through the government. And God been able to put him in positions of leadership. So, well, preacher, I serve the Lord and I help others. I'm glad you do. Now let me ask you this. Do you do it with a good spirit? Do you do it with a with a good attitude? Or do you grumble while you do it? 
Then he says, be example in word and conversation and charity and spirit in faith. Faith is just taking God at His word. It's believing God. It's trusting God. Walking by faith, not by sight. He said, Timothy, don't remember without faith it's impossible to please God. Don't, we don't look at life. We don't watch or move by sight. We, we go by faith. We go by what God says. Not by what we think or what, what it seems to me. How often do we say things like, well, I just don't see what the problem with this is. I just don't see why we have to do this. No, it, you're, not, you're not supposed to see it. You're supposed to go by faith. If that's what God says, that's what we do. We don't have to see it. We have to trust God sees it. And if God says it, that's what we do. <clears throat> so we move by faith. <clears throat> giving to missions is faith promise. It's giving by faith. Trusting God that He'll take care of us as we seek to get the gospel to the lost. It's all by faith. A church operates by faith. That's, that's how a church has to... Why? Because that pleases God. If you want to lose the blessing of God, begin to just operate by sight. But that's only true of a church. That's true of individuals. Think about your own life right now and say, what am I operating on where I've got to have God? And what am I operating on where I, just because I see it, I see how it all works. You know, when you get God involved, live by faith. Timothy, live by faith. Now you would think that it'd be easier to live by faith as you get older. But it isn't. Oftentimes we get older, you're more hesitant to step out by faith. seems like the, the younger you are, the more willing you are. Hey, let's do this. And you just launch out, man. Take the leap. But it should be the other way around. Us who have been saved for many years, we should be the first ones to say, man, let's trust God. Let's, let's, let's do this. Let's depend on God. God's always provided for us. Let's do this. And the younger ought to get encouragement from the older. Amen? So we're being an example of the believer in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and then purity. Faith will lead to purity. Purity means free from contaminating matter. If I want to be an example in purity, then I have to guard what I watch. I'm going to have to guard what I listen to. I have to guard what comes through the eye gate and what comes through my ear gate. I have to put up boundaries and barriers. It's interesting, isn't it, that, that, that faith and purity go together? And it's like the, the walk and the conversation, the, the word and the conversation, the word and the walk go together. The charity and the spirit go together. But the faith and the purity go together. So I'm walking by faith and I'm walking to please God and to live by the way God wants me to live, then it goes together. Am I, are there things in my life? that are causing me to be impure. We talked about this morning those trials that come into our life and troubles that God uses to turn up the heat, so to speak. What does that do? It gets the impurities out of our life. You know what happens? As long as nothing, as long as the heat isn't on, as long as we're not uncomfortable, you know what we usually change? Nothing. Well, everything's okay. But boy, when things get hot and things get uncomfortable, we're ready to change something. We're ready to do what God wants. And so, uh, faith, purity. Faith and purity go together. Years ago, the communist government in China commissioned an author to write a biography of Hudson Taylor. The purpose was to distort the facts and present him in a bad light. They wanted to discredit the name of the missionary who brought the gospel to China. As the author was doing his research, he was increasingly impressed by Hudson Taylor's character and godly life. And he found it extremely difficult to carry out his task that he was assigned. So eventually, at the risk of losing his life, he laid aside his pen, renounced his atheism, and took Christ as his personal Savior. 
Whether you realize it or not, example leaves a great impression upon others. Now, if we're all to be an example, and we're an example in these areas, how can I do that? Well, I'm glad you asked me because I want to tell you, okay? How can I do that? Let's see, Paul doesn't, Paul doesn't leave us hanging here. He didn't leave Timothy wondering, okay, how can I accomplish that? Here's what he said, verse 13. How to be an example. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. So he says, here's how you can be an example. Uh, give attendance to these things. When that word attendance there means to stretch. It means it gives careful application of your mind. It's going to stretch you a little bit. In other words, it's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be something that, that, that you know, growth is never comfortable. Growth is never easy. Change is never easy. Most of us don't like changes. We like things to stay the way they are. But here he's saying you have to, Timothy, if you're going to be an example, you're going to have to stretch yourself. You're going to have to give careful attention to these three things. Number one, reading. Reading. Reading what? Reading the Bible. Reading the Bible. Deuteronomy 17, 19. And it shall be with him, he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, and to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. Psalm 1, 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate. How often? Day and night. Day and night. Look at Psalm 119 with me, will you? Keep something in 1 Timothy 4 there. Look at Psalm 119. This is a tremendous passage. Of course, you know all of Psalm 119 is about the Bible. Every Scripture has to do with the Word of God. And in Psalm 119, beginning in verse number 97, notice what the psalmist writes here. Psalm 119, verse 97, Oh, how I love thy law! It is my meditation. How often? All the day. Thou, through thy commandments, hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers. I'm not sure I'd take that one to Bible college with me, but uh, don't be careful about that. Um, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep thy precepts. He said, look what he's saying. You've made, I'm wiser because I read the Bible. I have more understanding than those who try to teach me because I, I read the Bible. Listen, I understand more than the ancients. I understand more than people who are older than I am. Because I keep thy precepts. Wait, not only that, I've refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Thy word keeps me from going in the wrong path, from going the wrong direction. I've not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. So many things the Bible does for him as he reads this. No wonder the apostles said, hey, you, you go and serve the widows the, the food. We're going to give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the Word. We're going to give ourselves to the ministry of the Word of God. The, the, the people in Thessalonica who were more noble than those in Berea, and that they, or the Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica, and that they searched the Scriptures daily as to whether these things were so. Daily in the Word of God. Not the iPad, not the TV, not the iPod, not the DVD, the Bible. The Bible. I'm thankful that uh, when, when you need it and you have to look up a verse and you have something on your phone or your electronic device, that's fine. But that can't replace your Bible. You need the Word of God. You need the book. You're not going to you're not going to uh, mark or put in. This is your companion. When 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 times are tough, when times are difficult, you find yourself going to the Bible. And and I don't think I don't see people dying hugging their cell phone or their iPad to their chest. 
But I do see them hugging their Bible to their chest and loving the Word of God. From the Bible you get success and peace and blessing and wisdom and knowledge and understanding and strength and long-suffering and kindness. Why not read the Bible and say, oh, it's just hard to read the Bible. Yeah, I know, you've got to stretch yourself. You've got to stretch yourself and say, man, I'm going to do this. You don't have to get up and read an hour the first day, but start reading something and stretch yourself a little bit every day. You find out that as you, when you're going to get ready to run a marathon, now I'm not an expert, I don't run marathons. You could probably tell that right off the bat. But, you know, I know this, I don't go out and run 26 miles. You got to go out and start running a mile. And then once you run a mile, you add a mile and a half, and then maybe go to two miles. And you have to just build yourself up to that. And then we're pretty soon running a mile is nothing. And so you, you do that with the Word of God. But read it. Stretch yourself. He said, Timothy, give yourself to reading. Then he says, give yourself to exhortation. Exhortation. Exhortation is urging out. Urging out of the old way and into a new way. He's saying, Timothy, you're going to preach the Word of God. You're going to teach the Word of God. And when you do that, you've got to have an urgency about you. You've got to have an urgency when you speak to people. Can I say this? But when you preach the Word of God or when you teach the Word of God, when you talk to someone about the Word of God, that's to be an urgency. I'm not up here tonight to say, no, I think it would be a wonderful idea if you read your Bible. It's such a wonderful book. And if you would read the Bible, you'd be much, much better off with it. Well, that just motivates you, doesn't it? Huh? No. But you get up and say, man, you've got to read the Bible. Man, you've got to get in God's Word every day. What a blessing it is to read the Bible. See, there's got to be an urgency to what we say. Man, call it what you want. Chuck the corn, peel the bark, you know, whatever you want to, a phrase you want to put on it. But man, let her rip. That's what he's telling Timothy. Give yourself to some exhortation and, and exhort others, urge other people to stretch themselves. We, we gather together to provoke each other unto love and good works. So we're provoking one another and urging one another out. We need exhortation. You know why? We won't change otherwise. We just kind of keep things the way they are. So give yourself to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Doctrine, of course, is Bible teaching. Would you stretch yourself to learn Bible doctrine? Somebody, there, there's all kinds of studies being done about why, why kids who grow up in the church, when they turn 18 or 19 or 20, they leave the church. And then they don't, they don't stay, if they leave the church completely, or they don't stay Baptist. They go off into something else. Everybody's trying to figure out what is that. I, I don't know all the reasons. I'm sure there's a multiplicity of things behind that. But I know one of the in ingredients would be this. They don't know doctrine. And you have to stretch yourself to know doctrine. I know the big thing today, and we're, we're talking about it in Sunday school this morning when we're going over doctrine, is that, <clears throat> is that people want to make minimal use of doctrine. Hey, we just believe in Jesus. Let's fellowship together. Let's just talk about Jesus. Well, wait a minute, doctrine's important. The, they continued in the disciples' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. What came before fellowship? Doctrine. If your doctrine's not right, there's no fellowship. So doctrine's important. Have you stretched yourself to know the doctrines of the Bible? Do you get blown about by every wind of doctrine that comes along? And you can't tell what's right and what's wrong? Can somebody press you about salvation? Can you talk to me about the doctrine of salvation? What does the Bible teach about that? Just what does it mean when it says we're justified? What is justification? What is sanctification? What is glorification? What are those words the Bible talks about? What is predestination? What is election? Are some of us chosen by God to be saved and some of us chosen by God to go to hell? How do you answer those things? You should know doctrine. You should understand Bible doctrine. What about security? You're not one of them once saved, always saved guys, are you? Huh? Well, yeah, I believe the Bible. Okay? But you can't just say that. You're going to have to show from the Bible why you believe that. That's doctrine. That's the eternal security of the believer. Baptism, inspiration of the Bible, the creation. 
Can you tell somebody why evolution is not right and creation is? That's doctrine. You ought to know doctrine. Give yourself, stretch yourself, apply yourself to doctrine. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In fact, uh, you're, you're in 1 Timothy 4. That's 2 Timothy chapter 2. Would you look there with me real quick? Even if you don't go quick. Just look there anyway. <coughs> 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, they will increase unto more ungodliness. And in, 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 by the way, the verse before it, he talks about striving about words to no profit, but that subverts the hearers, overthrows, destroys the hearers. And in the, in the verse after it is about profane and vain babblings that increase to more ungodliness. What's in the middle? You study. You study to show yourself approved unto God. You're responsible to know the Word of God. You're re- you and I are responsible to know doctrine. To know what the Bible teaches. That's our responsibility. We ought to know God's Word. And so study to show yourself approved unto God. Have you stretched yourself to know Bible doctrine? How hard have you tried? It's the only way to be an example of the believer. How can I be an example in, in, in my word, and my conversation, and my... Uh, uh, um, charity and in my spirit and in my um, what faith and, ch- and uh, purity how can I do that I have to give myself to reading to exhortation to doctrine so do you now notice what he said to Timothy in 1st Timothy 4 verse 15 He said, meditate upon these things. Go over them all the time, Timothy. We'll keep going over them in your mind, in your heart. Give thyself wholly to them. Timothy, you've got to give it everything you got. Most Christians don't give Christianity everything they've got. Most most. You know, you, know what, you know what the difficulty is with our Friday night recovery is most people don't give their recovery everything they've got. They want it done for them. Most Christians want it done for them. Pastor, come give me, give me, you know, I, I'm not being fed. Well, you know what? You ought to get enough food yourself the other days of the week. Whether I give you something or not, you ought to be okay. Truth is, you're to, you're to give yourself wholly to it. And when you, listen, <clears throat> when I'm meditating on these things in my heart, I'm giving myself wholly to it. I'm in, all in, as they say these days. Notice what happens. He said, Timothy, your profiting may appear to all. Everybody's going to see a difference in your life. Can I, can I say this? You'll see a difference in your life when you give yourself wholly to it. You'll also see a difference in people's lives when they don't. you given yourself wholly to them so that your profiting would appear to all and then you'll be an example your growth your spiritual maturity will be evident to everybody I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day I'd rather one should walk with me than merely show the way the eyes are better pupil and more willing than the ear fine counsel is confusing but example is always clear And the best of all the preachers are the ones who live their creed. For to see good put into action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the sermon you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lesson by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. Do as I do. Let's be examples of the believer.
Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for this exhortation that Paul gave to Timothy that we have been able to, to glean from this evening. Lord, I believe that this is not only for a Timothy, this is for us today. That we ought to be examples of the believer. Just as Christ was our example, we ought to be examples to those who follow us. And Lord, I pray that as this world looks for someone who's a genuine Christian, looking for the real thing, I pray that we would be the right examples. That we would ask You tonight to help us. That in order to be the right example, we give ourselves, stretch ourselves to reading Your Word, to exhortation and to doctrine. That we would give ourselves wholly to them so our profiting would appear to all. So that others could follow our example.